Welcome to LATAM Expansion Insights, your go-to podcast for all things related to growing your business across Latin America. I'm your host, Chris Danks, and in each episode, we'll dive into the key strategies and challenges of expanding into this vibrant region. Today, we are joined by our special guest from TLC, Becky Ospina, who will share her experiences on the crucial decision between using an employer of record, also known as an EOR, versus setting up a legal entity. So whether you're a startup or a seasoned enterprise, this podcast will provide the insights you need to make informed decisions. Throughout this series, we'll explore the various solutions available for successful expansion into Latin America. So come and join us for insightful discussions with HR leaders who have first-hand experience navigating this dynamic market. So stay tuned for rich content that will equip you with the strategies and insights that you need to thrive across LATAM. Becky is a founding member of TLC and brings with her a wealth of experience in human resources with over 20 years in global leadership roles. Her passion lies in delivering a world-class employee experience by attracting, developing, and retaining top talent. Becky excels in designing and implementing people practices that enhance organizational capability and stakeholder satisfaction, ultimately driving business growth and fostering a best place to work type environment. And Becky, um, great to have you here on the podcast today. Thanks, Chris. Happy to be here. So let's jump straight in. So when expanding into the LATAM market, understanding key economic and cultural factors is really crucial in my experience. Uh, LATAM features a mix of emerging and developed economies. Uh, Brazil and Mexico offer large markets, while smaller countries like Uruguay and Costa Rica have other unique you know, opportunities in the region. So, Becky, when you first considered expanding your organization into LATAM, what were some of the key considerations that influenced your decision making process and how did you navigate these factors to ensure you know, a smooth entry into the market? Great. Thanks, Chris. So the absolute number one element that needs to be clear before expanding into any country, especially um, when you're looking in Latin America and as a region as a whole, is the business strategy and vision, the why. Why are you looking at growth expansion in Latin America? And the reason is later when you're making decisions, and as we'll talk about employer of record versus legal entity, um, those kinds of factors having a very clear business reason will drive decision making. Certainly cost, time zone, availability of talent, um, infrastructure of a related country, as well as um, looking at future growth, customer base, vendors and partners are certainly considerations. And when making those decisions, the business reason of why is really at the forefront and something you'll keep coming back to. Touch on cost, which I know is a you know very crucial component of, of decision making process, mm -hmm. obviously for, for many and certainly for yourself. Um, when you were moving into the region, would you be able to just share some experiences of of what those costs were? Because obviously you have the salary costs, the obvious things, but there's other costs as well, right? That you need to take into account when making these decisions that you wouldn't necessarily have domestically. Yeah, absolutely. So depending on um, the compensation packages. So unlike um, the United States, you know, as you move into the global markets, compensation packages tend to get much more complex and have a multitude of line items related to um, insurance benefits, time off, life insurance, pension, and those things can quickly add up. So looking at what would be competitive in a local market, because that is the benefit of um, whether you're partnering with an employer of record or opening a legal entity is having a competitive advantage to attract that top talent. Um, certainly underlying costs around taxes, um, setup, uh, administration and maintenance, you know, if you're opening any kind of facility or office location, remote, certainly, um, again, as you get outside of the United States, remote um, setups do have a cost to them where we're not typically accustomed to that in the U.S. Becky, when you chose to move into Latin America, you know, you've already touched on, on costs 
uh, time zones and you know skill availability and other things. How did you balance all of those factors to make a decision on which country or countries to move into? So when thinking about cost, there are certainly the salary um, and the benefits element, but there can be you know other hidden costs related to the compensation packages that we uh, may not be accustomed to whether it's um, you know in the in the United States or even some of the European countries, there are additional light items, for example, related to remote work. Um, there are some additional costs that are associated with that. Facilities costs if you're going to be opening an office or some kind of facility. Um, taxes. The tax burden can vary largely from country to country and the administration costs. So related to different paperwork or administrative filings can provide um, a burden to the organization that one may not be accustomed to um, moving into Latin America. So I think it's critical to find out kind of the whole element in the big picture of what those costs will be. Certainly talent, a top talent, you know, that you look at that as an investment and what kind of talent can compete with other areas of the world. Being bilingual was important to us, um, being able to communicate both with the corporate office um, as well as customers. So there in, in that, um, is a cost, right? Higher education, um, higher threshold of, of entry into the roles, and then technical skills. And so we were looking at a multitude of factors where we could cast a wide net of talent acquisition and um, customer facing roles with what those costs would be, certainly compared to Western, you know, a, a US or a, or a UK. Um, in Europe, the costs are significantly lower, and that was a big attraction for our organization. I was just going to ask you that in general terms, um, you know, did you make a cost saving from moving into the region? When you take into account all these other variables, I'm assuming there, I know it's not the only reason that you moved into Latin America or the countries that you chose to move into, but, um, you know, did you ultimately make a saving as well? Absolutely. Yeah, it was a significant cost savings with an elevation of service and support. So really, it was a win-win for our organization. And when, and when you went, were you considering other regions outside of LATAM or did you stick to LATAM, you know, initially because of the time zone, obviously, is a big advantage, whereas other parts of the world, you know, you, you're going to battle with that, I guess, if you're a U.S. headquartered organization. Was that was that your first thought when you were looking at LATAM before you started looking at the other factors? Yeah, absolutely. We were fortunate enough to have experience um, globally and have um, operations in Asia. And while the talent and the cost may have been, you know, fairly comparable, the challenge was the time zones and customer support. So depending on um, the region of the customer and the support levels, but then also contact with a corporate office and things just, you know, global town halls, um, global company meetings were very, very challenging to schedule when the entire company could be available to attend. We were very focused on an inclusive environment and wanted to create a culture in which um, employees were having a similar employment experience around the globe. And that was time zones are one of the biggest challenges. It's certainly, um, we're seeing a lot of companies move into, there's a lot of advantages to moving into LATAM. I mean, you know, LATAM is a continent. Obviously, every country is very, very different. But we're seeing, you know, I, I remember at the beginning of uh, 2021, there was just a huge influx of US organizations moving there. Obviously, the push towards remote working, hybrid working, and so on, saw a real shift with organizations looking to go in there, which actually at the time drove up salaries an awful lot. I mean, mm -hmm. um, Mexico in particular, I could name a few others, Brazil, um, but the uh, really did inflate the market for quite a while, like, actually to the point where I know many organizations actually 
considered, uh, you know, moving to another country, uh, maybe a lower cost country across LATAM. I think things have flattened out a bit then, but since then, but uh, but we've definitely seen a big shift anyway, and and the trend continues, right? It's it's not going anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. What we found is we could tap into a world class talent pool that provided the customer experience we're looking for at the price point and the cost levels that really made sense for a company. You hit the nail on the head with remote work, could deliver um, world-class products and services from anywhere. And Latin America provided a very um, rich and positive um, outlook for our organization. Becky, let's discuss the topic of employer of record versus legal entity and ways in which you can actually implement your model and set up in a new country. So there'll be many people on this uh, podcast that will be listening and tuning in that know all about employer of record and legal entity setups, and there'll be many that that don't. So um, a legal entity allows you, is the more traditional route, which allows you to set up a uh, establishment in country. The complexity varies massively country to country. There's a lot of variables there, but it's, it's the more traditional way of doing things to employ new staff. Employer of record route has become increasingly popular, particularly the last two or three years. And I know that's an option you've chosen uh, in the past also. So would you be able to just talk us through the pros and cons of each model uh, in your experience? Sure. So I, this is we're coming back to your business strategy, vision and goals is really important. And when you're looking at which path to take. The legal entity, in my mind, is long-term, large operations. So whether that is um, with having a physical presence in a country or not, having remote workers, but long-term and larger presence. Employer of record served very well when you're looking for a quick entry into a market because the employer record already has all of the infrastructure and foundation set up and the population of employees is going to be relatively manageable. Um, since the employer record have done all of the work for you, there's certainly a cost to that in my mind, it's very well worth it when it aligns with the business strategy. Um, our organization operated in you know, 25 plus countries around the world, and we had a large, you know, varied mix of strategies. And so it was really important to know what does that mean sort of long term for the organization. Becky, let's um let's look at employer of record versus legal entity and how you make them. so once you've decided on an employer of record in a certain country, there are you know so many employer of record organizations out there now. And many HR leaders, in my experience, you know, will qualify on cost, they'll qualify on service level, who's the best partner for them, but maybe don't know what else to qualify an employer of record on. You know, many of the solutions are fairly similar, I would argue. So what did you take into account and what was your decision-making process when you decided to use an employer of record to, to pick the right partner for you? Once you have chosen your expansion strategy, whether it's through an employer of record or a legal entity or, or any other model, what were the key steps that you took to implement it? So the first thing that, that we really did was look at the, the market and the talent. So again, were we looking at hiring one person who was an account manager in that region to um, service a particular customer set? Were we looking at setting up more of a technology hub um, who were servicing, again, more of an internal kind of corporate um, support model? And so the talent available was critical to understand what that market looked like. Some countries have a very large technology talent pool. Um, the infrastructure and the education support that. Others, the focus is on being bilingual and the language. And so those might be more of a customer support. You know, others are um, sophisticated, you know, sales and business development folks. 
And so really understanding what that makeup looks like and how that best supports the business. And then what are kind of the barriers to entry? So when looking at um, a legal entity, again, some countries, you know, long-term, larger expansion, larger employee forces would be the key versus quick entry, um, potentially smaller sets of employees. And so signing contracts, you know, establishing um, tax entities, um, legal, um, getting a legal partner, you know, is really kind of the first um, major step to understand what are the details that it takes to open a new market. It's really great. Yeah, thanks for, for the insights. I'm sure many people here will find if they've not expanded into other regions or particularly into LATAM, will find these insi insights very, very useful. So just um, kind of talking about the overarching uh, strategy of moving into LATAM. Are there any specific strategies or other best practices that you would like to recommend to ensure a successful expansion into the region? One thing that really gets a lot of attention is kind of the data and the analysis, the cost model, the employment model, the revenue model. What does the customer base look like? And that is all extremely important, but there are certainly intangible elements that are critical, they're in alignment with the business as you expand into other countries. So you are not going to come in and change a culture of a country. You want to marry well with it what is aligned to your business. So for example, shift work. Third shift may or may not culturally be supported by um, the country's kind of cultural norms. We had a situation where we were trying to implement a third shift that was not aligned locally to the cultural norms and ultimately was unsuccessful because, again, we are not going to change that. We need to find there are different time zone setup or countries that support shift work. There are certainly many countries that do. Um, things like empowerment, leadership. Decision making models, you know, when you go outside of the US, the decision making, the hierarchy, authority, those kinds of things that are more intangible, they're not as much written down um, in a book or in a cost model are certainly important because when you are trying to design your expansion model, understanding those cultural elements are important to say, okay, this is something we value, that aligns well, this is not as important, so we're not going to be as concerned about that when all of the other boxes are checked. Yeah, brilliant, Becky. Yeah, I think there's so many things outside of uh, the, you know, the obvious, like you say, I think the key point that I took from that was the, uh, you know, not just looking at data, it's, it's understanding the real cultural nuances, how you're going to integrate that with the business. I agree, I've seen it many, many times where organizations try and um should we say they try and get the new country the new office to adapt to their you know their headquarter country's culture whereas actually i think what you're saying is you need to really adjust to the to the different markets to make make it successful and feel like one joined up organization so i think that's um i think that's really valid do you just lastly, Becky, to to start to wrap up here? So, do you have any other top tips you would recommend to other HR leaders that might be on the start of their journey when faced with expansion? As an HR leader, you know, I think about making recommendations to the business that not only work for the people piece, um, but also the long term revenue cost and profitability of the organization. And so I'm looking at a very measured and cautious approach. If you are doing all of the research and still kind of unsure if this is, um, you know, legal entity or employer of record, this country is going to be 100% match for your organization, I would recommend the employer of record approach. And the reason is you can go down the employer of record journey and convert to a legal entity later once you find out you're having great success with the model. Or you can stay with the employer of record 
model. Once you go down the legal entity path, then it is extremely difficult to switch to the employer record model. And so that's really a key difference in my mind, um, especially when you're looking at risk levels. You know, business leaders like, you know, low, you know, lower cost or lower barrier, barrier of entry and lower risk. And that's where I feel like the employer of record model offers because you can um, see if this is something that marries well with your business. And if it does, great, you've provided a great recommendation. And then you can at some point convert to a legal entity if that makes sense for your business or not. You can stay with the employer record. We found that net net, um, even though employer record does have higher costs associated with it, it was still a lower cost expansion than looking at some of your higher cost countries, for example, the US. And so for us, um, really as an HR professional, I try to make very good sound business recommendations that are not only work for the people, that align to the culture and the strategy, but that are also meeting the needs of, you know, when you think about revenue, profitability, the bottom line, and what is really driving a lot of business decisions. I feel like the employer record model um, does marry well with that and expen expansion globally, being able to leverage um, different talent costs, um, partners and vendors um, around the world. Um, there's a lot of really great, great partners and vendors that we've worked with and have had extreme success. And so while you want to be cautious and, and think about those things, um, just do your homework, do your due diligence, keep that business strategy and vision at the forefront of your decision making and, and aligning to that. And I think you'll find a lot of success. Thank you, Becky. That was really great. I'm sure that a lot of people here will have will have got an awful lot from this podcast, especially if they've not worked in LATAM or potentially with employer of record models. Um, today, we've talked about the decision making process on which countries to move into, particularly taking into account, you know, the skills available, the time zone, the cost. We've also run through and discussed the decision making process that Becky went through uh, when deciding between you know employer of record or EOR and legal entity, as well as how to qualify the best partner for your business. So we certainly hope that that insight was very useful for you. On the next episode, we're actually going to do a deeper dive into the employer of record model, and we will be joined by guests from Velocity Global, who are a leading global employer of record organization. And uh, Becky will also be on that uh, conversation with us again, a uh, second time in a row. So please do join us for that. Um, so that's the end of today's podcast. I hope you found the discussion engaging, useful and informative. Uh, a big thanks to you, Becky, for joining us here today and sharing your insights and being so open about you know, your decision making process. Hopefully that'll be of value to many other HR leaders and professionals. Until next time. Thanks very much for listening and we'll see you on the next podcast.